Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you I've not had the honor of meeting yet, my name is John Allen. And I'm the president of the Brookings Institution, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all today to today's event, the AAPI uh, Heritage Month, Safe, Safeguarding American, Asian American Inclusion and Belonging. We say that again, the AAPI Heritage Month, Safeguarding Asian American Inclusion and Belonging. Now, on behalf of all of us at Brookings, I'd like to begin by offering my profound thanks to the distinguished members of Congress who have pre-recorded remarks and will be featured in a few moments. Representative Andy Kim and Representative Grace Mung, uh, both of whom have been esteemed individuals on, in Congress and have been great champions for our Asian American communities, especially amidst the terrible crises that we face today and the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes in America. Indeed, with the passing of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act last week, a very important moment in American history, actually. It seeks to directly confront the scourge of anti-Asian hate in this country. There could, there could hardly be a better moment uh, to celebrate the leadership of the Americans who've been involved in these activities. And two of them will be speaking to us today and to discuss the many challenges uh, still before us in safeguarding our cherished Asian American communities. Additionally, I'd be remiss if I didn't offer my sincere thanks to our Brookings staff for pulling together this event today. Uniquely, our programming today was organized by a mixture of employees across the entire institution, uh, from one department to another, uh, and at all levels within the institution. And I'd like to thank, in particular, the Brookings Inclusion and Diversity Committee, but also Adrian Chong, Chorn, uh, Suzanne Schaefer, and especially Greg Sung. Uh, for their personal leadership in furthering our institution's ongoing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've said this many times, Brookings is a great place because of our people. And that goes for all of our incredible staff as well. So thank you for your contributions to putting on today's event. Uh, and we know that everyone will benefit from tuning in today. Now, as a part of the month-long celebration of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month at our institution, it must be said that today's event also follows a recent national tragedy. Uh, two months ago, we were shaken to the core by the horrific murder of eight individuals, six of whom were Asian women in Atlanta, Georgia. This terrible incident, uh, which of course occurred amidst so much suffering already in America, remains as a stark reminder of how systemic racism and xenophobia and harm, harmful rhetoric can impact Asian American families and Asian American communities writ large. Recognizing our role as an institution long dedicated to the public good, we saw a pressing need to convene both experts across and outside our organization to discuss the state of Asian America. Uh, importantly, we need to talk about how policymakers can create both domestic and foreign policies that can benefit, not endanger Asian Americans and the greater Asian diaspora. Furthermore, made up of more than 23 million individuals, many of whom can directly trace their lineage across the Indo-Pacific region, Asian Americans remain one of the fastest growing populations in the United States. Their perspectives, their history, and their rich culture are crucial to the fabric of today's society and the future of our country. In other words, the story of Asian Americans is the story of America. And while events like these uh, will not solve problems of racism in America alone, these kinds of public events, we do remain very hopeful that these kinds of conversations started here can help inform the public discussion happening anywhere from the halls of Congress and all the way to the many dining rooms across America and community centers that have a vested interest in moving together the entire population of the United States and treasuring in that process our Asian American communities. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers, starting first with uh, Representative Grace Mung 
Representative Mung has led the New York six district since 2013 and is the first Asian American to be elected to Congress from the great state of New York and has long been one of our nation's leading advocates for Asian Americans among many other very important issues that she has embraced. And following Representative Mung's pre-recorded remarks, we're also honored to and feature, uh, honored to have and to feature Representative Andy Kim. Since coming into office in 2019, Representative Kim has been one of the greatest leaders on the issues of equality and inclusion for all Americans, but especially for our Asian American communities. And before his current role representing New Jersey's third district, Representative Kim served in Afghanistan as a civilian advisor within the US State Department and also served in my headquarters in Afghanistan as a dear friend. He would later serve on President, Obama, uh, on President Obama's National Security Council. Once both of our representatives uh, have given their pre-recorded remarks, we'll then transition to two great panels, one focusing on domestic policy and the other on foreign policy. So before we move on to our program today, a quick reminder that we're live and we're on the record and audience members are welcome to submit questions via events at brookings.edu. That the address again is events at brookings.edu or Twitter using the hashtag AAPI month. Hashtag AAPI month. So with that, thank you for joining us today to this on this very important moment and this very important event as we celebrate the rich heritage of our Asian American community. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'm Congresswoman Grace Meng from Queens, New York. Thank you, President Allen and to your team for organizing this event during APA Heritage Month. While I wish I could be with you at your event, Representative Andy Kim and I are actually at the White House right now for a ceremony where the President will be signing my COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, making it the law of the land. This is a momentous moment for our nation. For the past year and a half, the Asian American community has been living in sheer terror. May is supposed to be a time of joy, celebration, and reflection, but it's been anything but that. Asian Americans have been spat at, slashed, stomped on, shot and killed. Our businesses have been vandalized. There's been over 6,600 reported acts of such violence with over two thirds of them to women. And this is just the reported numbers. In New York City alone, there was a 1900% increase in anti-Asian violence in 2020. Even as two million Asian Americans have been fighting on the front lines of this unprecedented pandemic, a dark shadow of violence, terror and pain was cast over our community. But I believe better days are ahead of us. On Tuesday, my COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act passed the House of Representatives by 30, 364 to 62. It followed the Senate vote, which had passed it by 94 to one. Now today, President Biden is signing it into law. The bill, which I introduced with Senator Hirono, will designate an individual at the Department of Justice to expedite review of COVID-19 hate crimes and incidents. It would also address reporting problems at the local level by requiring the Attorney General to issue guidance for the creation of online reporting mechanisms the collection of disaggregated data and expansion of public education campaigns to empower local communities. It would also bring federal agencies together with community-based organizations to raise awareness of hate crimes. The COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act would also help strengthen hate crimes reporting. We know that hate crimes are severely undercounted. Roughly 18,000 law enforcement agencies report to the FBI, but only about 15,500 report on hate crimes, meaning that nearly 2,500 don't participate at all in reporting hate crimes. And of those that do report, many fail to report accurately. 80%, 86% of all participating police agencies affirmatively reported zero hate crimes to the FBI, including at least 71 cities with populations of over 100,000 
which would be great if it were true. Ultimately, you can't mend what you don't measure. That is why the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act aims to help improve hate crime reporting by creating the infrastructure and oversight to allow more effective reporting. It would also create state hate crimes hotlines and allow educational classes directly related to the community harmed by the offense. For too long, our community has been invisible. But today, with the signing of my bill, Congress and our president are taking a stand with the APA community and calling out the shameful anti-Asian hate. I look forward to a day when our children, our parents, our grandparents can walk safely again in their neighborhoods without fear of being attacked. We are closer today than we have been over the last year and a half. Thank you and I wish you all a wonderful event. Hi everyone, I'm Congressman Andy Kim from New Jersey and I wanted to thank Brookings and I wanted to thank President John Allen for this amazing invitation. I feel honored to be able to be a part of this and to be able to share some of my words with all of you. President Allen always has been an honor to be able to serve with you uh, in government and to be able to continue this mission alongside you in terms of trying to move our country forward, try to have the kind of thoughtful engagement that we need and deserve as a democracy, as a society. And right now, what we're gathering to talk about is about this very moment, about what it means to be Asian American, Pacific Islander, to be AAPI Heritage Month. I'll be honest with all of you, this Heritage Month feels different. I've celebrated and observed this month in previous years, but this one feels different. In the aftermath of the shooting down in Atlanta, to the attacks that we see against API elders across our country and the growing uh, discrimination and racism and, and frankly violence that we've seen over this past year, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. And what we recognize when we take a step back is that we're living through a historic moment. We're going through a lot as a country. We're going through a lot when it comes to racism writ large in our society. But when it comes to the API community, I very much believe that this is a historic moment. I've never seen this level of engagement and outreach and intensity when it comes to the API community in this country, nor have I seen this level of attention in our country given towards the API community in our country. I really do believe that the next few weeks and the next couple of months will really shape the next couple of years, if not longer, of how AAPIs are treated in America. Now, the question is, what is that going to look like? What are we going to do about this? What actions can each of us take to try to move that in the right direction? Grace Mang and others have been working alongside, been doing incredible work in Congress. And we need to make sure we're keeping that up. But what we recognize as well is that there's no single piece of legislation alone that's going to solve all these problems and get rid of the racism and the discrimination that the API community faces, as well as the fact that the challenges that we face are not just due to COVID, that we've experienced discrimination and racism well before COVID, and we will continue to experience it after COVID. Certainly gasoline has been poured on the fire, but what we need to make sure we're doing is seeing and hearing exactly what this discrimination looks like. That starts by understanding that the API community is not monolithic. And that's something that we understand different experiences that are out there. Granted, there are some common threads and themes and experiences that are shared across. And I think that we understand that that's going to be a deep wound in our society and something that takes a lot to be able to address. I've seen it in my own experiences. I've seen it working even within government. 
I've shared recently an experience that I had when I worked at the State Department before, almost uh, 10 years ago, probably. I had an experience where I was, uh, you know, I was at the time uh, working on Iraq and Afghanistan issues. I had top secret security clearance. And I remember I showed up to work one day at Foggy Bottom and I saw an envelope on my keyboard. I opened it up and I read it and it was a letter informing me that I have now been banned from working on issues related to Korea simply because I'm Korean American. Now, this was a real shock to me. I wasn't even trying to work on issues related to Korea at the time. I wasn't applying for any jobs. This was a preemptive effort, a proactive effort by my government beyond the security clearances that I had already gone through, telling me that they didn't trust me. That was how it felt for me, that after working in Afghanistan and putting myself in harm's way and doing all these other efforts, this letter told me that my employer, the United States government, didn't think that they could fully trust my loyalty to this country, that if I was engaged in an issue, where I was working on my uh, South Korea, my country of heritage, that the government worried that I would not be able to represent America fully. And there lies this question, what does it mean to be American? What does that mean and for me as someone who was born here in the United States, that I honestly, I don't even speak Korean very well. It hurt because this is the only home I know. And I kept growing up hearing this mantra that our diversity is our strength and that America embraces our diversity. And that's what makes us unique and special in the world. I grew up with that. But when I have these experiences, and that was not the only one, but when I have these experiences, it makes me feel like that is not actually true in practice. And that the concern, that the issue is that diversity is a concern. It's a potential threat. It's something that we have to worry about. We have to observe, we have to monitor. I didn't feel welcome. And there comes back to that question that I often hear, which is, you don't belong here. I've heard that over and over again in my life. And I never thought that I would hear that at the State Department. Literally the place that is the face of America to the rest of the world. I share with you that story because first of all, we need to fix this. We need to take steps to show that our diversity is our strength, that we mean what we say, that we wanna have the kind of diversity within our government, that we want a government that looks a lot more like the rest of America. What we also wanna say is that when it is our strength, that it's something that can make us better, that we want to do this not just because it's the right thing to do and that we want to have that equality and that equity reflected across our government, but we also want to make sure that we do this because it'll lead to better policies, better laws, better actions for our country to take. And when so much of our foreign policy right now that we're talking about is about what is the United States relationship with China? What are we going to do with allies and partners in Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific area? I want us to think about our diversity as a strength, that maybe it's a good thing for us to be able to have people who have deeper cultural and historic ties or personal ties or language skills, that this is something that we can benefit from. That's something that I want to, us to move towards and get towards. And I hope that I can continue to work with many of you through the work that I'm doing on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Armed Services Committee to try to move that needle forward, try to find ways to really address that and fundamentally be able to discuss and shape that question about what does it mean to be an American? What does that look like? What is it that we want to show the rest of the world. Now, this is all the more important right now because of this new era of foreign policy and global politics that we're entering. In. I truly believe that the world that we are re-entering into is different than the world that we 
socially distanced from last year, that our goal right now is not to dial back the clock to February 2020, but we are emerging into this new paradigm moment. Like 9-11, like the fall of the Berlin Wall, this is a new era. This new era will be hugely shaped by this singular question of what is the United States relationship with China? And therefore also looking at the bigger picture across, across the Asia Pacific. Now, if that is the case here, then we need to be very careful about how we approach this. When we talk about renewed great power competition, that we shouldn't immediately just think of a neo-Cold War type scenario, something that just kind of dusts off the playbook that we had decades ago, but we try to look through it with a new invigorated lens to see it for what it is. The reason I mention this is that this is not only the challenge of our generation, but this is also a moment for us to think about how the implications of foreign policy affect us here at home as well. As an Asian American, what I'm also saying is that I worry that this new era of global dynamics and this competition with China, if done improperly, if discussed and, and verbalized improperly, could lead to a new era of xenophobia here in America. I think about what I saw the, uh, the Muslim American community, the Arab American community facing after 9-11. I think about what we understand with the Japanese internment. And I'll look at even just my small slice of this, my humble slice of this as an experience where I had my loyalty, loyalty question at the State Department because of my last name and the color of my skin. So I just ask us to be thoughtful about this, that we not only think about what we are trying to accomplish, but we think about how we go about doing it and how we treat people along the way. That's something I want to commit myself to working with all of you around Brookings and throughout the broader community. A lot of us are looking at these questions, but I hope that we are doing it in a comprehensive 360 way, of looking at how these dynamics are so fluid that there is no firewall between foreign policy and domestic policy, that we recognize that we live in a world with that fluidity that goes beyond anything that we have seen before. And that's something that I think we want to be mindful about. Now, I'll tell you, I don't have all the answers. I don't have that perfect vocabulary about how we talk about this. But I want us to work together to strive to do that and be sensitive to that as we talk through it. Try to understand how these dynamics are interlinked and how our words do have repercussions, good and bad. So with that, I just, again, think that this is a moment especially this Heritage Month, a moment for us to be able to think through what comes next. What I hope is that we pay attention to the issues facing the AAPI community, not just through the month of May, not just through Heritage Month, not just when we see murders and violence on the front pages of newspapers, but I hope that we can do this sustained throughout the year, throughout years going forward so that we can continue to lift this up and talk through a way in which we can be, A, proud of Asian Americans in our country, their heritage, our history, our contributions, but also talking about how it is fundamental to how we move forward. So with that, I'm just grateful again for the invitation to speak with all of you and to be a part of this event. We will share with you some of my thoughts and words here during this incredibly historic time. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you all. Take care. Well, I want to say to those words that I'm actually speechless. Um, I'm going to introduce myself in a moment, but as I listened to the representative and his remarks, I was reminded of what James Baldwin, the uh, great Black scholar, said in the uh, book, The Price of the Ticket, that what is it that you want me to reconcile myself to? And that conversation that we just heard of what is it for me to be an American? I think is one of poignant words, particularly at this time. So I want to thank both representatives for um, providing their remarks, particularly at a busy time where they were unable to be with us physically. And I want to thank President Allen for allowing us at Brookings to actually express and talk about these issues in a safe space and to have all of you join us. So thank you as well for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to participate in this conversation. 
As it was mentioned, we will have questions and we ask that you email those to events at brookings.edu. And we also ask that you continue to tweet this event at AAPI. I'm Nicole Turner-Lee. I am a senior fellow in governance studies here at the Brookings Institution and the director of the Center for Technology Innovation. I actually hold, I think, an honorary affiliation with our China Center. So my dear friend and colleague, Chung Lee, will be moderating the next panel. And I'm also one of the research scholars that works on Brookings New Racial Equity uh, Initiative, where many of us are trying to delve into these issues in a very granular way to intersect policy with the lived experiences of various groups. And with that, I'm excited today because this conversation that we're having, and it's off to a really good start, is really a conversation that's going to be candid in terms of how do we address not only what's going on today, but how do we address the ongoing historical circumstances that perhaps have led us to where we are today? And so I'm joined in this first panel, which is primarily going to focus on domestic policy, but obviously is going to have some impact of the geopolitical circumstances between US and China. Uh, but I'm joined today by three distinguished experts that I'm pretty excited to talk to on this panel. And for those of you that know me, hopefully I will talk less and they will talk more. Uh, because as a sociologist, these issues are very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Willow Lung Aman is a non-resident senior fellow here at the uh, Governance Studies Department, in which I work at the Brookings Institution. So I want to welcome her. Janelle Wong, who is the professor of American Studies at the University of Maryland, will also be joining us today. And Frank Wu, who is the president of Queens College and a distinguished author known by many of you, will also be joining us as well. So I wanna thank the three of them for being with us and I wanna to pivot to our conversation. So I think that they are on with us. I don't necessarily see their face. I know I have my glasses on, so I'm gonna take a sign from the Brookings Tech people that we will pivot to each of their presentations. I wanna start first with Frank. And Frank, I know when we talked recently, there was a lot of history that you shared and expressed that I knew and some that I did not know. So I wanna start this conversation by level setting because I think what we've heard from both representatives is this deepening scar that racism and discrimination leaves. And I think it comes from one that is, you know, sort of unhealable, right? Because they've not necessarily addressed the real uh, problem that is actually making that scar still open up and those wounds bleed when the salt is poured in. So Frank, why don't we start with you to provide some historical level setting on the AAPI community? And what I'd also like for you to really talk about, right, is what does it mean to be Asian American? Like I said, I was just struck by what Representative Kim kept saying because I just remember that as an African American having those same conversations uh, and, and seeing that historically. So Frank, we'll pivot to you, and I know you've got some slides to show us as well. All right, great, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. An honor uh, to be here and to hear my Congresswoman Grace Mang. I live in her district, uh, and I've known Andy Kim uh, ever since uh, his student days at Deep Springs College, so uh, wonderful uh, to follow the two of them. I'm gonna make three points. Uh, I started off as a law professor, and law professors always make three points. So I'm going to talk about uh, the main images that affect Asian Americans historically. So I'll show a few PowerPoint slides. I know I have only four minutes and 30 seconds left, so we're gonna move fast uh, through this. All right. So uh, you should be looking at some PowerPoint slides. Would someone just nod and indicate that, that you see some PowerPoint slides? All right, great. So the first uh, is the black-white paradigm. Uh, we talk about race as if it uh, is just two boxes, literally black and white, that comes from the Kerner Commission report in 1968 that looked at the long, hot summer of 1967 when there were either riots or rebellions, depending on your perspective. The best-selling book, Two Nations, captures this perspective. Um, I think this is just wrong, not as an Asian American. I think it's wrong as someone who wants to have a picture of the world that's accurate. It leaves out people who are Latino, people who are indigenous, people who are mixed, and of course, Asian Americans. It's not out of ethnic pride that I ask that we be included. And Asian Americans have always been there. The inclusion of Asian Americans should be to help not harm the historic struggle for black equality. So take a look at this photo from Life Magazine. That's Malcolm X when he's assassinated, lying, on the floor of the Audubon Ballroom in New York City, 1965. Look at who's cradling his head, one of his closest confidants, colleagues, associates, Yuri Kochiyama, 
Japanese American. There she is uh, a few years later giving a black power salute. She was alongside Malcolm X until he drew his last breath. Look at the Japanese American Citizens League and the delegation dressed in their Sunday best out to march with Martin Luther King Jr. on the hot sun in 1963 when he gives his famous I Have a Dream speech. Asian Americans have always been there. They've been there in solidarity. Look at Martin Luther King at Selma. He's wearing a lei. This is when Hawaii was a brand new state having joined the union in 1959. It's pre-easy air travel before overnight delivery. It was a difficult logistics job to ship fresh lays from Hawaii to the deep south but it was done because the Hawaiians who knew Dr. King wanted to show their solidarity and Dr. King in turn wanted to show his and uh, virtually everyone at the front of the line is wearing a lei. All right. So the black white paradigm simply inaccurate and it's not historically true. Asian Americans have been here since before the civil war. Hundreds of Asian soldiers fought in the union and Confederate armies. I'll tell you, I was shocked to learn that myself. There's a whole book on the subject. I'm going to zip through some of these slides. So the second point is Asian Americans, and I know Will is going to speak to this, are characterized as the model minority, which is inaccurate because there's high levels of income inequality. It whitewashes bias. And now, of course, those who have achieved, I applaud them. They deserve our respect. But the model minority myth actually ratchets up racial resentment, the idea that Asian Americans are so hardworking, they're unfair competition. They're regarded as superior workers, not inferior ones, and therefore have to be excluded. But most of all, the model minority myth is often false flattery. It's a none too subtle way to send a message to African Americans and other people of color. Hey, look at the Asians. They made it. Why can't you? Using Asian Americans as a pawn. The third image that's important is the perpetual foreigner syndrome. That's what Congressman Kim spoke about. It doesn't matter if you're second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation. Yes, there are Asian Americans who are sixth generation. There are Asian Americans whose ancestors came on the Mayflower. Now, when I say that, people are puzzled. Anglo-Asians, they're mixed. Senator Tammy Duckworth spoke so movingly when she ran for office, uh, the office she now holds, about how her family had an unbroken record of 13 generations of service in the armed forces of this nation, how her forebears fought alongside George Washington, to which her opponent promptly mocked her and said, well, he didn't know there were Asians there. She was speaking of her father's side. She, uh, as a Duckworth, could be in the daughters of the American Revolution. On her mother's side, she's Thai Chinese. So this has real consequences. The internment, when two thirds of those incarcerated were US citizens, two thirds, including veterans of the Great War as World War I was called. So this is how Asian Americans so often are treated, either literally, legally, formally excluded during the Jim Crow era with the Chinese Exclusion Act extended to an Asiatic barred zone, denied citizenship through naturalization because they weren't free white people or figuratively excluded. So uh, there's one last uh, pair of slides I wanna show, but the three main points I wanted to make are the images, uh, the themes that define the Asian American experience are one, it's a black white paradigm, Asian Americans don't fit, two, the model minority myth suggesting, well, you got nothing to complain about, we all know you're doing well anyway. And three, the perpetual foreigner, which is you don't even belong, where are you from? Where are you really from? No, really. I mean, where are you really from? As if to say that's where you should go back to. Where does Asian American come from? So uh, one of the things I say is there aren't any Asians in Asia. When I say that, people are puzzled. Well, there aren't that many Europeans in Europe or Africans in Africa. Asian, uh, uh, Pan-Asian identities associated with imperialism. It was a euphemism when Japan during World War II said we're going to have a East Asian co-prosperity sphere. That was about the annexation of neighboring territories. So Asians fought total wars against one another just two generations ago. Stroll down the street in Shanghai, Seoul, or Saigon and say to people, what are you? Who are you? None of them are going to say I'm an Asian. They'll identify by national origin, by ethnicity, by faith, by language, by region, by dialect, by clan. They're not Asians, they're Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Indian, Pakistani, Burmese, Filipino, Laotian, Cambodian, Hmong, and so on and so forth. But here, we're told you all look alike. And so uh, Asian American as a term has two uh, very interesting origins. The first is uh, the civil rights movement and student activism. Uh, two uh, young students, Yuji Ichioka and Emma G, 
Japanese American and Chinese American. This is them much later. In 1968, during uh, the um, student activism, when there was a yellow power movement, yes, that's right, yellow power modeled on black power, they came up with this term to bring together Asian Americans to say, yes, your ancestors hated my ancestors, but here we have common cause. Let's build bridges. Let's declare we're really American. That term didn't exist before then. The other origin, Directive 15. You might never have heard of this, but in the mid-1970s, the federal government, the OMB, created five racial categories, although they've revised it just a little bit. Every time you fill out a form for the federal government, it uses this classificatory system that was invented in the mid-70s uh, and uh, promulgated formally in 1977, and Asian or Pacific Islander was one of those categories. So out of student activism and government bureaucracy, we got Asian Americans. I look forward to our dialogue, and I'm honored to be here uh, with good uh, colleagues uh, and friends. Back to you, Nicole. Look, Frank, I was just going all up in your alley because as a sociologist who studied collective uh, memory and social movements, I mean, that's where I really started from. I was starting to feel you on that, right? Because it's this distinguished um, nature of our ethnicity and our race versus our power uh, grids, I think is really important. Now, Will, I want to come over to you. I, I, I'm not going to say that Frank took some of your thunder here <laughs> because I know you got a lot to talk about as well, but I want you to sort of debunk this homogenization, homogenization theory, right, that we heard from both uh, the members of Congress as well as Frank as he was sort of starting to unpack this. Speak to me a little bit about why we got to this model minority, right, and why this is one of those areas that we need to unpack for people if we're going to really get down to some of the reasons why we're having this conversation today and why this month doesn't, you know, feel particularly um, happy and celebratory. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to Brookings for having me here in this forum. It is really a pleasure to be amongst such great company. Um, Frank really did steal my thunder um, and, and really laying the groundwork for a fabulous conversation. I actually learned so much from his comments already. Um, but I just wanted to, before I get to your question, lay a little bit of, of groundwork about my entry point into this conversation. I am an urban planner. Um, by training and um, in my scholarship. And so I think a lot about issues of the built environment and especially how that impacts um, public policy. Most of my work on Asian Americans has happened in the context of suburbia and in the context of neighborhood change. So I've been thinking a lot about how both higher income, upper middle class Asian Americans who are integrating into predominantly white and middle class or upper middle class neighborhoods are welcomed um, or and um, face the kind of um, politics around, uh, particularly around development um, that happens inside of this community, these communities, in part, and in part debunking some of these ideas about um, Asian Americans as the new whites, um, those that freely integrate into uh, white um, communities because of the high rates of home ownership, because of the high ra higher rates of income, which as we know is only a selective group of Asian Americans and there's a whole history of behind that. So my first book project really tackled those issues within the context of Silicon Valley, thinking about how um, those who were predominantly um, middle-class, educated, professional immigrants were integrated into these communities. And what I talked about um, in that was uh, sort of the ways in which um, non, in which um, Asian Americans were often perceived and contested by established white residents city officials and policymakers as an other, right? And how this um, was integrated into the kind of contestations over the physical landscape, over schools, over um, so-called Asian malls or these retail shopping centers that were predominantly occupied by Asian retailers and over the rebuilding of homes in a form that some called the McMansion or the monster home. Again, suggesting a kind of foreignness to this idea. And so I talk about how Asian Americans are really racialized through the built environment 
And what I mean by that is what we, the ways in which we can see both whiteness reflected in the kind of valued and valuable landscapes of suburbia, but also how we can see Asian Americans otherwise through their, um, the ways in which they're constructed um, in their, uh, in their communities and their spaces are marginalized as well. So that's kind of my entry point into this conversation. I am currently working on a second book project where I'm really thinking about um, um, Asian Americans in the context of Black um, and Latinx communities and those that are gentrifying in suburbs. I'm not specifically talking about Asian Americans, but Asian Americans are part of my story that is really trying to, as um, Frank introduced, sort of um, disrupt some of these black white binaries in terms of thinking about issues of redevelopment and gentrification and where it happens and who it happens to, um, decentering it out of the urban context, but also out of just the black white paradigm that I think is so important. And thinking about how that has affected Asian Americans, not only in places like Chinatown, and places, um, the historic ethnic enclaves that they are being pushed out of, but also to certain places in suburbs, which are now the predominant home of Asian Americans and inner ring suburbs and outer ring suburbs and the kind of struggles um, and cross solidarities that are being um, built in those kind of environments. Um, so questions about affordable housing, questions about small businesses and the retention of those um, environments and questions about organizing. So that's what I've been up to. And those are the kind of um, perspectives that I bring to the conversation. Now, you asked me to say a little bit about um, the model minority myth um, and its impacts and how it obscures some of the heterogeneity that Frank um, and others have already spoken to. And what I want to say here is just to remember that the model minority myth is a product of white supremacy, right? It is a way of justifying racialization and racism in ways that marginalize and oppress all non-white people, right? Um, so it's saying, as Frank has already said, that if Asian Americans can do it, everybody can do it. But it ignores the racial hierarchies and differential power relations specifically the anti-Black um, struggle in the United States and the way that, that um, um, the colonial legacies um, and settler colonialism in the United States and the ways in which there's sort of always this remixing of the racial hierarchy that no matter what happens at the bottom always keeps white folks on top. And importantly for our conversations today, um, it undermines solidarity, both in with interracial uh, solidarity with Black and Latinx communities, as well as inter um, intra-racial solidarity amongst the Asian American communities and those who don't, which is the, actually the vast majority of Asian Americans who don't fit the paradigm, right? So it says in those cases that you're not really Asian. Right, because you're you don't perform at the same rate. You don't. You're not upper class. You're not educated. You're not professional Asian. So you're therefore not part of this um, this myth, and therefore um, something that binds us as Asian Americans. And so the more that we can bring attention to the ways in which Asian Americans fail to fit this stereotype and the fact that it is a myth born of white supremacy. Um, the more we begin to chip away at its power. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's so interesting. So I'm writing all these notes because um, when I was in graduate school, there was the book on the minor minority. Uh, you guys might know the author. It's fleeting my, my memory right now. But part of this whole idea of collective memory and acculturation and the divisive sort of frameworks that have always been posited because you look at race as a social construction, you realize that it's socially constructed to maintain systems of oppression, right, against certain groups. And so I think it's so interesting I talk about it. And hopefully we'll get to some time because intergenerationally, We've seen that collective memory in many respects sort of diluted, which could give the impression that one group's oppression is greater than the others or less than the others, which I think is such a fascinating way that you start to break down these, these ordered relationships that you're talking about, Willow. Now, Janelle, I want to go to you because in your case, because we're sort of seeing this trail here, 
talking about history and level setting. We're talking about the politicization of um, these, these terms and these narratives. And now I want to talk about political power in of itself, right? Because there is this myth when we start to get more heterogeneous in our understanding that Asian Americans don't fit anywhere in the political realm. That's not what your research says, right? In fact, and I want to just put this statistic out there, um, AAPI data suggests that voter turnout increased uh, significantly in this last election cycle from 51% to 58%. But we're also seeing, and I'll just combine this for the sake of time, a lot of coalition building in the, the elections in Georgia, et cetera, where Asian Americans are playing a significant part. So talk to us a little bit about that in terms of the political side of this. So we can also put this all together. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, let me just uh, go ahead and share this screen. So I, I really appreciate my co-panelists' uh, wonderful presentations, and I hope that we can um, all come together around these key themes. I will just echo what you said, that uh, our data from API Data, where I'm a senior researcher, show that Asian Americans, this is actually the latest data, um, show the highest increase in voter turnout. Now you can see here, there's still a ways to go, but this is quite significant um, in terms of their increase from 49% um, turning out in 2016 to 60% to in 2020. And we know that that was very significant in the uh, Georgia context, especially uh, the runoffs there. Uh, you can see here also that there's some kind of political coalescing. We could sort of say that there might be um, a kind of um, adherence to the Democratic candidate over the last, uh, especially 15 years post-election estimates, this was a pre-election survey, show that about 65 or 67 percent of Asian Americans voted for Joe Biden. So there's still a lot of heterogeneity, but we're seeing a pretty strong trend over the last decade. And I just want to pivot to some data that I collected just two days after the attacks in Atlanta with my colleagues um, at API data. And this is also joint with survey data, uh, Survey Monkey, And it just really, I think, shows some of the trends that both Frank and Willow have uh, brought up in terms of two stereotypes, the forever foreigner stereotype and the model minority stereotype. So there is a lot of attention to hate crimes against Asian Americans, but over um, the respondents' lifetimes, what you can see is that Black Americans, and this is important for solidarity, are the group uh, most likely to report hate crimes. In 2021, just for the first months of 2021, we see that all racial groups, including Black and Latinx and Asian Americans and Native Americans are experiencing hate crimes. And this is confirmed by other data that show that Native Americans are especially likely to have experienced hate crimes since the start of the pandemic, but that Black and Asian Americans experience hate crimes at about the same right, rate over the pandemic. To the forever foreigner stereotype, Many Asian Americans have been encouraged to whiten their names, about one out of five. Pacific Islanders are even more likely to have that be the case. Have people asked where you are from, assuming you're not from the US. This is something Frank mentioned, and here we see it again reflected in these data, 64% of Asian Americans. Again, this was just two months ago. Have you, but at the same time, we see that Asian Americans don't experience race in the same way as other groups. So. Have you been unfairly stopped by the police or experienced um, mi police misconduct? Of course, we know this has affected Black Americans more than other groups. 40% report yes versus just 14% of Asian Americans. And have you ever been experienced housing discrimination? Again, a topic that um, is critically important. We see that this affects Pacific Islanders who are part of the AAPI community, Black Americans, but Asian Americans are less likely to report this kind of discrimination. And then if we turn to being unfairly discouraged by a teacher or advisor from continuing your education, you can see the model minority myth kicking in. So it's side by side with the forever foreigner kind of implicit bias. We see that Asian Americans are the least likely to report this kind of discouraging bias, but Black Americans, 23%, Pacific Islanders, again, very high as Native Americans. So this just helps you to understand, I think, racial discrimination and the kind of complex experiences of Asian Americans in the larger landscape.
Yeah. Do you know, I wanted to stay on you for just a second, because I think that those are really trying um, statistics that also point to the fact that this is not a homogenous monolith community. When we see these high rates of numbers among the Pacific Islander community, why would that be the case? I think Willow had mentioned it before. Colonialism is a <laughs> is a powerful force and uh, Pacific Islanders have experienced, you know, deep colonial relationships with the U.S. where we still have many military bases on Pacific Islands and uh, have, you know, and many Pacific Islanders still fighting for their native rights. Yeah, yeah. So that speaks to and something we'll hopefully touch on the panel for, on the domestic side, some of the uh, uh, relations between geopolitical circumstances, right, and how that impacts not just, you know, what people's perceptions are of you, but how you live, your lived experiences here in the United States. So I want to turn for a minute because I think um, John Allen talked about it, which is that horrific day where we actually saw, you know, not only the continuing violence that happened with people like uh, George Floyd, but let's go into the gen uh, post January 6th insurrection. We see this attack in Atlanta on Asian Americans, right? And and it was one I think that stopped all of us short, not because that happened, but we have seen these egregious acts continue to happen. So I want to open it up to the floor to any one of you. After listening to our members of Congress, I mean, is it legislation going to help us mitigate those types of um, acts of violence? And, and what role does public policy actually play? How will it help us mitigate these circumstances? Frank, why don't I start with you and then we'll go around. Sure. You know, uh, the issues aren't new, but the awareness is new. Asian Americans have faced systematic violence for the entire time there have been Asian Americans. In Rock Springs, Wyoming in the 19th century, the entire Asian population was killed or driven out. In downtown Los Angeles in 1871, when Los Angeles was just a frontier settlement, one out of 10 of the Chinese immigrants uh, were killed. These were arsons, shootings, lynchings. They were organized, they were carried out by whites some of whom were themselves immigrants. Sometimes people say, oh, well, this was citizens against foreigners. That's not the case. Many of the demagogues who attacked the Asian immigrants were themselves European immigrants, such as Dennis Kearney from County Cork, Ireland. So none of this is new, but until Atlanta, there's been such denial. I can't tell you how many frustrating conversations I had with people who said, well, how do you know it's racial? Even though people are shouting things like, go back to where you came from, or the disease is your fault, or they're using those slurs, chink, jap, gook. And I use those words deliberately to show they have no power over me. But even in those cases, friends of mine would say, well, oh, come on, that, we, we don't know that that's a hate crime. Well, all right, as a lawyer, I can say, am I sure that technically it meets the uh, evidence standard? Well, maybe not. So I don't know if the person is a racist, but I can say the effect is racial the effect in each instance and cumulatively, certainly. And when you have all these viral videos, you realize, all right, this is not random. These people are being targeted. In Atlanta, it is not random. You don't kill six Asian women unless you go looking for Asian women. And then shockingly, the law enforcement officer in charge, after the perpetrator confessed, said, well, he was having a bad day. I thought, well, that's gotta be fake news when I saw that. But then, no, he actually said that as if not only to deny that it was a hate crime, but to dismiss that it was a crime at all. And then, of course, the officer himself was discovered to have been propagating the China virus meme on social media. This happened in a toxic environment. And the videos that we see of people being spit, so it starts with just slurs, all right? People sometimes say, oh, come on, don't be politically correct. They're just calling you names, right? But it escalates and you don't know when it will go from there to spitting to shoving people to the ground so hard their bones are broken or they're put into a coma, to stabbing them, to shooting them. And these are all mistaken identity twice over. Don't get me wrong. It's not right if you find a Chinese foreign national, beat them up. That is wrong. But the people who perpetrate this, they don't pause and say, may I check your passport? I'll leave you alone if you're actually a US citizen. So they get the ethnicity wrong. These people who are Burmese, Korean, Filipina. In Los Angeles, a Chicana woman was called a chink and then brutally beaten. And of course, it's U.S. citizens and immigrants to this nation. They've got nothing to do with the virus, but it's all come back to the forefront, not microaggression, explicit in your face. I'm going to stab you because I think you caused this virus and it's why I have to wear a mask. 
That's right. what's going on. But, let, but let's talk about it. And, and Janelle or, uh, you know, what is this in terms of the policy, though? And then I'm going to come over to Willow. I mean, is policy going to be a mitigator for this? We have the anti-Asian hate crime bill. And then we also see this push towards Asian American education, which I think is a response to this re refutation of critical race theory. How can legislation play a role in sort of to quell what, what Frank has outlined? Legislation is uh, symbolically important, and there are elements of the um, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that, you know, lead to better data collection and also to some restorative practices. I do think it's important to note that many Asian American organizations have been uh, very cautious in terms of supporting any kinds of policies that will lead to additional policing and surveillance of Black and Brown people. And I'll let Willow continue on. Mm -hmm. Willow, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I, I agree that it's symbolically important. I would also say that it is important substantively to some extent, but certainly not comprehensive enough. I mean, just the fact that it's labeled a COVID bill suggests that this is something unique without historical grounding, as opposed to part of what Frank is saying, which is a long history of anti-Asian discrimination that has been built into the fundamental bones of this country and built into it not through individual hate and bias, which I think is why some people don't like the term Asian, Asian hate, because that implies that it's not systemic in nature, that it's inter interpersonal in nature. And I think these problems um, stem out of the white supremacist, not only the culture, but actually the, the, the bones of policy, particularly around um, immigration policy, but also domestic policy as well, um, that has really focused around civil rights issues and housing, as Janelle has introduced, and other, and other issues as well. So we need this um, right now for, as, as Representative Monk suggested an accounting, right? Um, you can't mend what you can't measure, as I think what she said, but you also can't reduce Asian American hate incidents to a measurement at this point in time, when we know that there's so much un under reporting and we know that this has such long and broad implications. So it is a, it is a step towards a more restorative or reparative framework, but it is certainly not comprehensive enough um, to be be a full um, com a part of a fuller conversation about what the um, implications of this moment and where and how we got here. Yeah, no, I mean, I like this, and I, I'm gonna keep pushing this panel just a little bit if you don't mind, because I think part of this goes to this revelation among the Asian American community that racism exists, right? And I think you all have laid out that for years it's sort of been this ordering of systems of oppression, and in particular, African Americans and Black Americans have been most affected. With that being the case, before we go into coalition building, it's important for us to address that too, right? Because in the scope of a model minority, there's also been sort of this uh, model, discriminatory model where there's been, you know, some Asian anti-Blackness that has come or some uh, non-alignment between goals. So I'm, I'm curious, I'll start with you, Frank, you know, how do we address that? Because what we're seeing is, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter has been out there. We see stop Asian hate, you know, but at the end of the day, we should be saying stop hate for everybody, right? But there's also been this fundamental uh, 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 undergird that we have not always addressed when we try to talk about coalition building. Yeah, so I'm going to take this on directly, and I'm going to say something that might upset some folks, but that's okay. I think it's important to say, which is we got to call out anti-Blackness among Asian Americans. I'll give you a specific example. Even after Atlanta, and if you, you aren't aware, the perpetrator in Atlanta was white. Even after Atlanta, people have contacted me, and they've said, hey, woo, when are you going to stand up for Asian Americans against black people? Now, I, I need to emphasize it's not any victim, and I'm not going to criticize anyone who's a victim of, of violence. These are demagogues, right? And they know that I do talks. They, they know that I've been a civil rights activist for my entire life, but they want me specifically to emphasize black criminality and reinforce that stereotype. And I'm just so troubled by this uh, because I explain, I'm not going to rise up against black people there and yes there are perpetrators there's no question there are perpetrators of this violence who are black and brown they are persons individuals who happen to be black 
They're, they're not black people, right? It's not, they're not representatives and it's just going to make everything worse if we frame it that way. There's something else that some of them do that is not helpful. I've heard people say, you know, um, Americans had, had better respect uh, the Chinese diaspora. China's rising, China's gonna be powerful and they're gonna be answering to us soon. I think to myself, ah, oh, geez, you know, that's just gonna make it worse. You're just reinforcing, you are spreading the yellow peril message as if you believe it. You know, that's, and it's a misunderstanding of people who are majority where they are or are coming from who don't understand what it's like to be a domestic minority here. What will work is bridge building and emphasis of American ideals that Asian Americans want what other Americans want, which is to be able to walk down the street. And when you say that, you can't help but catch yourself and then realize, wait a minute, African Americans can't walk down the street in safety either. They can be jogging and hunted down and murdered in a video that people film because they feel they can get away with it they can be bird watching in Central Park. And if you're gonna generalize, you know, I'm gonna generalize. Bird watching is probably a pretty peaceful pastime. And I'm thinking bird watchers are not really a threatening group, but people can call because they think you're a thug. There was a rally in Flushing, Queens, one of the most diverse places in America just a couple weekends ago, and I was honored to speak. I looked at the crowd, there were all these Asian Americans, and I said something truthful. I've never seen this. I've never seen so many Asian Americans protesting with signs, standing up and speaking out, but I've also never seen something else. On the podium, Senator Chuck Schumer, Mayor Bill de Blasio, uh, State Attorney General uh, James, the borough president who's African American, Congresswoman Meng, civil rights activist Al Sharpton. There were people who were black, there were people who were Latinx, there were people who were Jewish, alongside Asian Americans. I've never seen that either. So this gives me hope. Asian Americans are finally standing up and speaking out embracing the diverse democracy and their role in it, and then others are joining them. I've, I've never seen that happen, and it gives me hope. The legislation that passed, President Biden's statements, all of that is unprecedented in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I, I want Janelle and I want Willow to respond to this. I have to tell you just a little secret. So I, I'm one of the surrogates that goes with Chung Lee to China, <laughs> gone for the last four years. And I felt racialized for a minute when I was in China because apparently they did, there's not a lot of black people walking around China, you know? So there were a lot of people want to take my picture, but I told somebody what wonderful experience I did have is I had a lot of people stop me, a lot of people stare, take my picture. And then one time I turned around, I told people, if you're gonna take a picture of me and I don't speak Chinese, so I had to use it with my hands and stuff. I have to take a picture of you. And when we realized that the two of us had to take pictures together, I'm on WeChat, they're on Facebook, but guess what? We were smiling all the same. It goes back to what you said. We have to recognize what these vulnerabilities are if we're actually going to bend them. But Willow, I mean, when you think about what Frank said, right, part of what we're seeing today is this is de deliberate pitting of our groups against one another. How do we get to the coalition building that you spoke about? How do we begin to embrace white supremacy as a core theme for why we need voting rights, you know, to prosecute the person in Atlanta quickly or why we need to have these coalitions for policy changes? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll just say at the outset um, that my father is a Chinese immigrant, my mother is African American. So I live this in my body. I, I live this in my own family. Um, and I see the ways in which these groups that are actually so intertwined in their histories and their experiences have often been rendered as um, opposites on the spectrum of racialization and of experiences in ways that um, don't do serve anybody other than the white supremacist framework under which we live. Um, so, you know, I think um, how we get to coalition building is by, you know, coming out in solidarity together and understanding our shared histories. I mean, part of what Frank sort of started us with is talking about the yellow power movement. These are not isolated incidents in our history. These are quite shared histories in our in parts of our history. Racial zoning that has, has, has um, been so much a part of the African-American experiences was that which created Chinatowns, right? Or, or Japantowns. These were racially restricted areas by racial covenants, by zoning by uh, redlining, 
the, the, um, the histories of groups standing up together during the civil rights movement, the Japanese American Civics Leagues, um, those um, groups that were inspired by the NAACP um, and worked in solidarity with them as well as the Black Power Movement, that was part of the civil rights movement, but it's just not part of what we hear about the civil rights movement. So I think part of creating space is also understanding that we have always worked to some degree in solidarity because we have always had shared and similar experiences. And I think when we lose that thread is when we lose um, the grounds for solidarity. And so it, I am inspired in this moment by seeing um, more Asian Americans coming out in solidarity over Black Lives Matter and on the other side um, in, in um, Asian, um, Stop Asian American Hate campaigns, you know, that you see African Americans and Latino Americans and Indigenous Americans really coming out. And so I think that we are at a moment where a lot of these um, histories are needing to be retaught but also there's a generation that's not quite buying in to the old narratives about um, the ways in which we are separated. And I think there are many people like myself that embody these shared narratives and we need to be speaking more to the ways in which that is a lived experience for many people. Yeah, I mean, Jack Lord, who's out there somewhere, just sent this note. I can't phrase it as a question, Jack, because I run out of time. And I want to hear from Janelle and then take a couple more questions. But he says we need to really start with commonality, right? Because we do use Asian American, Black American. But I would say to you, Jack, though, but sometimes we got to recognize that our diversity is actually all American, right? So we got to keep that in mind. But you know, I, I don't like ending panels because what we're talking about, as John Allen said, is this domestic terrorism that we need to get a handle on, gun violence. Uh, the type of collective activism that respects um, our ability to protest and not coveted surve surveillance. But I want to ask you one thing, because I would be remiss. And then for those of you listening, I got a set of questions. If you have any that I think I can answer, events at brookings.edu. Janelle, let's talk about resiliency. In all of this, <laughs> Representative Kim Mang, come on now. We haven't seen that in Congress in terms of historical. How do we take that lesson of resiliency who we're seeing appointed in the Biden administration and run with that so that people recognize that the glass is overflowing versus being half empty? Yeah, I think we have a very important opportunity here. And uh, Representative Meng and uh, Representative Kim, I think also they're, they're on the policy side. And what we have to shift to now is not only the um, shared protests, but also shared support of policies. And so I think we are seeing more support for addressing anti-Asian violence and Black Lives Matter issues through investment in communities, in anti-poverty programs, in understanding that policing is um, can be dangerous for all of our communities if it is executed in the wrong way, right? And so one of the things I just like to emphasize here is that, you know, we have seen actually one of the call for solidarity and investment in our communities, we have seen Black Americans with institutional power again and again stand with Asian Americans. This starts with Frederick Douglass and the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? And then for Asian Americans, I want to press a little bit harder. Are we seeing that among Asian Americans with affirmative action, with protests against the integration of magnet schools. And I really think that those are areas where we need, you know, Asian Americans should not be at the forefront of dismantling those equity programs. That's not solidarity. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I was going to ask about that, but I didn't have a whole lot of time. So I'm glad you brought it up. I have a question I do want to ask all of you, which I think is going to be a question that I wanted to ask you before, but I'm glad that this audience member has asked this. Escalating tensions with China may continue to put a target on the backs of the AAPI community at home. How do we prevent tensions with China from becoming racialized here in the United States? So any of you can answer. And it is, there's a panel after this for those of you who are watching that will deal with this, but I would like the domestic policy panel to sort of address this directly. I'll say quickly that we, you know, the history we laid out it shows that in times of economic vulnerability, in times of national uh, anxiety, there will be often a um, 
scapegoating that happens when China is the focus. At the same time, we do need to hold China accountable for human rights violations, and we need to make that distinction. Pressing China on human rights violations does not lead to backlash against Asian Americans in the US. It's really the yellow peril narrative that is connected to backlash. Mm. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, because I got a whole list of questions I can go to. <laughs> All right, I want to ask this question because this is not a normal question we actually get this conversation. It's not something we've talked about so far. How do we lead safe space conversations for AAPI employees in the workplace? The, these, uh, the last question was a great question. This is a great question. I'm going to say something gently provocative. You know, Asian Americans face explicit in your face bias. They face implicit bias, the microaggressions, including compliments like my, you speak English so well, but there's a tiny germ of truth in some images. And I don't want to generalize, but I am going to say something. There is something Asian Americans do that is not helpful. And I say this with the utmost respect for my parents. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the standards they set and the sacrifices they made that I need to appreciate more. But every East Asian culture has a sentiment, an attitude, similar to the Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks up is pounded down. What's that about? It's about fitting in. It's about not making a fuss. It's about deferring to one's elders, uh, fidelity to tradition. Uh, it's about being compliant. There's a Chinese phrase, the loudest duck is shot first by the hunter, right? If you're Mandarin speaking, which translates as, you know, don't go looking for trouble. Don't go looking for complications. Don't, don't get involved. Stay out of things. Compare that to the American adage, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. In all the discussions of hate crimes, everyone underreports, but Asian Americans in particular grossly underreport because of language issues, they're worried about sympathy, but also because it's embarrassing. You don't want to bring shame to the family. And one of the most difficult parts of these conversations is understanding the traditional Asian cultural aversion to saying you were a victim, to just talking about stuff, you know, mental health issues, any of these things. Uh, when I was young and I wanted to get involved, my parents would say, no, no, we, we Asians, we, we don't do that kind of thing. We, we don't protest. You know, that's for other people, not for Asians. Well, with due respect to my parents, what worked for a different generation in a different era, maybe in a different place, it might not be the best strategy for a diverse democracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I have a question here that I want to ask you that is also coming from one of our listeners. I mean, at the heart of many of the uh, conversations we've been having this afternoon is class, right? And class as it's related to ethnicity and background. How do we speak for, you know, groups like the Vietnamese or the Laotians or others who have some different experiences than Chinese Americans based on class? Do you see these wholesale policies working to protect them as well? Or do we need to start thinking about how we address uh, the systemic economic inequalities that exist within the aging community, but also binds them to the, uh, you know, the issues that affect other groups of color? Yeah, I mean, I always think when we address those who are most marginalized in any group, we uplift everybody um, who is a part of that group. So if we start with economic marginalization, if we start with conversations about colorism, if we start with conversations about gender inequality within the Asian American communities, and try to legislate from that perspective, you know, learning from ideas about critical race theory and intersectionality, um, then we um, end up making policy that helps everyone. Um, and so I think um, a lot of these conversations are sort of starting as if there is a middle ground amongst Asian America, as opposed to really trying to reach to those who are most um, disparately affected and trying to build policy from there. Um, and so I suggest um, that we really look at whether these, um, you know, these class tensions, these um, colorism tensions, the gender um, and nationality um, is, is really addressed. And I, I don't think that is often the starting point for our policy conversations. 
I'm going to close with this question. Look, I have a couple of questions I want to ask, but I'm looking at the time and I don't want our dear moderator and my friend uh, who's co-hosting this uh, Chugley to jump out of his screen and tell me to get off because we have another battle to go to. But I would like all of you to answer this last question, if you can, quite briefly in our last three minutes. And this actually is a question that comes from one of our, our listeners here. How are we going to come up with a con or what is our concrete plan to ensure the daily safety of the AAPI community? Because I think at the end of this conversation, we've we've really wrapped our heads around the need for legislative policy, the need for a re-narration and a better understanding of Asian American history, but people are not safe <laughs> right now. And so I would ask each of you to sort of respond to that, maybe add your last closing thoughts. But this question right here, any concrete plan that we can do to ensure the safety of the AAI, AAPI community every day in daily life? Janelle, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think the the data I shared shows that, you know, most communities of color are experiencing high rates of racialized violence right now and reporting high rates of racialized violence. And this is not something that's uh, solved immediately. This is long term, difficult investments in community safety through anti-poverty programs, through mental health programs and through other kinds of community engaged policies like K through 12 education. Right. So the Asian Americans themselves are getting organized. That's great to see, but we need allies. We need every bystander to be an upstander. And uh, there are a couple things that I think won't work that are also being promoted. One is there's a movement, you might not know about this, but on WeChat of Asian Americans going out and buying firearms. Uh, that's probably a bad idea and someone's gonna get shot sooner or later uh, unnecessarily. And uh, over uh, reliance on, on law enforcement, uh, to have a greater police presence might not actually produce the result that people think it will produce. And so what we need is to get organized and to have allies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willow? Yeah, um, I'd echo everything that has already been said. Um, I think that Asian Americans are not safe as long as other communities are not safe too. Um, so recognizing that you cannot isolate, just like you can't isolate the, vi the virus and say that the United States is safe from COVID when um, the, there's high rates of infection in India or in Africa. We are not safe unless other communities are safe. So it is absolutely essential that we build in solidarity with other communities and that we support because we know that we are also victims of police violence, right? So as, as Janelle is saying, the, the anti-poverty programs, the education, the police, the defund the police movement is just as, as much about um, supporting AAPI communities as it is about supporting Black communities. That's right. And I would say, you know, I didn't really talk a lot about it because I deal with tech, that what that 14-year-old girl did in Minnesota to capture a record through her smartphone, the killing of George Floyd, is the same thing that we need to continue to do in our allyship to ensure we see these acts of violence that we reported so people can see it and we could do something about it expeditiously. Woo! I tell you, I could be here for another hour, but I'm not going to do that because Chung Lee is next. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for actually participating in this conversation. I hope that everybody was listening to this conversation it did a couple of things. It sort of debunked your own stereotypes and made you think about a few things, but it also connected not just the domestic policy with the geopolitical relationships, but the fact that we got to do something about really level setting what these struggles are and how there's hope at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to introduce Chung Ling. You're up next, my friend. He is the distinguished director of the John Thornton China Center and a senior fellow in foreign policy here at Brookings. And my last name is Lee, L-E-E, he's L-I, and we often say that we're siblings by somebody's birth. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much, Nicole. I want to stay to continue to hear uh, the conversation. Really, thank you for moderating that uh, fantastic panel discussion. It was so rich. Uh, in terms of historical context, new ideas and data, and the thoughtful policy recommendation that I want to watch video again later on when it is posted at the Brookings website. Now, I certainly remember our time together, Nicole, uh, in China, not only one trip, but the two trips. You were such an American goodwill ambassador 
and the wonderful educator of multiculturalism, along with many other things. And thank you again, Nicole. Now, also thank you to all of the speakers in our keynote session and also domestic policy panel for an engaging, illuminating, and forward-looking discussion. Now, it is my pleasure to moderate uh, the second panel, which I anticipate will be just as enlightening as the first. The second panel focuses on the implications and impact of the recent rise of anti-Asian racism on US foreign policy. One does not need to be a rocket scientist to recognize the close linkage between the rhetoric surrounding COVID-19 along with the current foreign policy perception of the China threat and the growing number of cases of violent hate incident against the AAPI community, especially in light of the ongoing prevalence of Sinophobia in the United States. There's a history of directing blame toward a certain vulnerable group for the spread of disease. Dehumanizing people, whether it be based on ethnicity, religion, culture, or country of origin, especially from an enemy country, is not a new phenomenon in US history. We don't need to look further than major historical moments to find these cases. Japanese and Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor attack, Russians and the Eastern Europeans during the Cold War, Japanese again in the 1980s when Japan merged to challenge US economic su supremacy. You know, and actually Frank Wu wrote a book. Uh, there's a, a Chinese American that was mistaken as a Japanese American and, uh, and uh, 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 was killed, murdered. And also Arabs and the Muslims after 9-11. Today, both the pandemic and the drastic deterioration of the US-China relationship have brought the discrimination and the hate crimes against the Asian American community to the forefront. This epidemic of anti-AAPI bigotry does not align with the conscience and the constitution of our country. It also damaged American reputation and the soft power influence abroad. We need to develop a thoughtful approach to protect American security in confronting a global China and its assertive foreign policy on the one hand and upholding American values in a diverse multi-ethnic democracy on the other as the previous panelists, uh, uh, panelists the previous panel emphasized. We are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from three young but already well accomplished Asian Americans scholars to address this daunting challenge. Diana Fu, both a Chinese American and a Chinese Canadian, is an associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto, a Rhodes Scholar, an award-winning book author, and a public intellectual affiliated with several US think tanks, including Brookings. Diana has lately been on the front lines of public discourse, denouncing xenophobia and the racist attacks in North America. Russell Shaw, uh, Russell Shaw is the executive director of the Global Taiwan Institute. A lawyer by, by training, Russell has had broad work experience, such as the editor of a China Brief and a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation and a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. Russell is an important addition to this panel as he will provide a distinct, uh, distinct perspective as a Taiwanese American. Last but certainly not the least, Jessica Lee, a Korean American, is a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute. Jessica previously led the Council of Korean Americans, a national nonprofit organization that supports Korean American leadership development. Jessica worked for many years on Capitol Hill, including serving as a staff member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Welcome you all. With their different ethnic backgrounds and the foreign policy perspectives, they will provide multifaceted analysis and the policy recommendations. 
Each of them will offer five minute introductory uh, remark as the previous panel. And then we will have a Q and A, a discussion. Over to you, Diana, you are the first. Thank you very much, Chung, for that generous introduction. And I, after hearing the first panel, I'm just so jazzed up to keep talking about some of these issues. But hopefully with this panel, we'll also sort of fill in the slight silence that we saw there when the moderator previously posed a question about how you know, the anti-China, anti-China threat um, a narrative really feeds into the experiences of Asian Americans here. So I want to speak very briefly from my own positionality. I, as Chung mentioned, I'm both a Canadian, I'm an Asian American, as well as an Asian Canadian, and I'm also Chinese. I was born there, so I'm a first generation immigrant from China. And so I'm calling in, uh, joining in today from Toronto. So I wanted to first start off by giving you a little bit of a comparative perspective. So I can tell you that despite uh, Canada being one of the you know, countries with the most friendly reputation, the friendly neighbor up north, we are actually experiencing an epidemic of Asian hate here in Canada as well. So this, this Asian hate is not an American phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. And one of the statistics that really shocked me when I found out about it recently was a report that was put out by the Chinese Canadian National Council, which found that during the period of the pandemic, there were more instances of anti-Asian racism reported per capita in Canada than in the US alone. So that in itself sort of shocked me, but I also wanted to, um, without delving into the comparative element there, I also wanted to just echo the first panel in saying that this has been posed and been framed as a pandemic issue. But really, this is a historical problem that goes way back before this crown-shaped virus hit our society, right? It goes back to the Chinese Exclusion Act in the U.S., which was uh, first signed into law in 1882 and renewed in 1992 that prohibited Chinese people from coming over just on the pure basis of race. And this was also paralleled in Canada which had a very similar act that was called the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Chinese Immigration Act, as, as it was called, that actually prohibited Chinese people from coming over to Canada for 24 years because of this yellow peril that we've been talking about, that um, you know, white Canadians, white Americans really felt that the, the rush from China to join, uh, the rush of Chinese workers coming to North America for the gold rush and also to construct our very own railways was really posing a threat to society. And in the neighborhood that where I work, uh, where I work and live um, in Toronto, there's actually a sculpture commemorating the 17,000 Chinese rail railroad workers who had come from China to actually help build and construct the Canadian Pacific Railway and thousands of them perished. And it wasn't only, it wasn't until 2006, so very, very recently that the Canadian, former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized for the C Canadian um, Chinese Immigration Acts. So that's the first point. And the second point that I wanted to raise, which is in direct parallel with um, the, the, the discussion we had earlier, was that Asians we Asians are both the victims as well as the perpetrators, the agents of racism. And you already heard a lot about the model minority myth, but I wanted to give you a personal perspective because I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, having moved to the United States, moved to, uh, moved to both Canada and then subsequently to Minnesota, a very white suburb that I grew up in, um, hearing the Chinese community discourse around race, you just grow up internalizing and embodying the Asian model minority, which is that you keep your head down, you work 10 times as much as your white peers. And then you, when you look at other people on TV or when you look at other peers that aren't as successful as you, maybe African-Americans or other kinds of other types of Asians who aren't as successful, you, you internalize the model minority myth and you, you think, well, it's because they're not working hard enough. They don't have the same cultural values that we have. Uh, it's because of that work ethic uh, that they lack, that they're not getting to where we are getting to. And so what I wanted to emphasize was that this, is, this kind of internalization of Asians uh, especially first generation um, immigrants of the mo model minority myth is actually a huge stumbling block to establishing the kind of coalition politics that um, the former panelists talk about. 
And I wanted to draw the connection to China using a very brief example. Um, some of you may have, and Cheng, I'm sure you, you've, um, you've followed this, um, this incident where a, a year ago when the George Floyd issue happened, uh, when the tragedy actually unfolded, there was a Chinese American uh, student from Yale University who wrote an open letter um, to the Asian American, to the Chinese American community saying that, hey, we should really be standing in solidarity with BLM protesters. So that's a really good thing. However, uh, the response from the first generation, the parent generation, as we call it, of Chinese people, um, both abroad and that was very widely circulated among Chinese social media was that us second generation uh, Asian Americans were being brainwashed by liberal American professors mm -hmm. and really emphasize, and there was a, actually a letter that was written in Chinese in response to the Yale students letter saying that really, um, you know, this kind of, we, Asians don't share much experiences with, with, with black people, with the black community, and therefore, you know, don't fall into the trap of standing in solidarity with, uh, with BLM protesters, because there's not much there. And so what I, what I wanted to highlight was that there's a very real tension in terms of first generation and second generation um, sort of ideas and opinions about, um, about these racial issues. But um, as a sort of in between, I guess, I'm first gen, second gen, some, somewhere in between the two, um, I, I find it very hopeful that, 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 that there is a generation of, of Asians who, who are speaking out about this. Um, so I just want to stop there. I probably already overstepped my time, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, to, to the rest of the panelists. Oh, uh, Diana, I mean, it's really excellent. Uh, you are within five minutes, I think so. Um, no, two things that uh, one is uh, you really bring a Canadian experience, you know, broaden our horizon. So it's not just the major power competition, you know, this affected uh, these kind of uh, uh, tensions, but also in countries like Canada, also you see that phenomenon. And uh, this is very important. Actually, you're right that it's a, to a certain extent, it's a universal, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a global issue and uh, in many parts of the, uh, of the world. Secondly, you also raise the issue about the generational differences about the immigrants. That's it's a very important perspective. I think it's very, very important that um, uh, younger generation that uh, uh, be more aware about uh, uh, racial uh, injustice and also more sensitive about uh, the, all these kind of stereotypical views. I mean, for Asian Americans, certainly there are a lot of things we need to learn. And thank you for sharing this uh, insight. So next one, my friend, uh, Russell. Well, thank you very much, and, and Greg, as well as Brookings, for putting together this very timely conference um, and for inviting me to speak alongside such a distinguished group of foreign policy experts. Now, I know that you've asked me to focus on being Asian American in our foreign policy discourse, so I will try to do just that. Um, I want to basically make three points. <clears throat> the first is we should acknowledge the progress made on Asian American inclusion, but we must clearly recognize that problems remain. The second point is that the problem transcends one political party or leader. And my third point is that we must be mindful that foreign policy can have domestic implications. The inverse is also true. So what do I mean by my first point? We are at a far better place than in the 1880s or the 1940s, but we must recognize that there is a long stain from hate crimes and racism in this country and those did not wash away with the legislative corrections in the 1960s and the 1980s, which were covered in the previous panel. What those laws provided were to simply put boundaries around behaviors that we as a society decided to prescribe. But even if legally prohibited, they do not eradicate or prevent them from actually occurring. Now, as an American of Taiwanese, and I'm sure Jessica may be pleased to know of Korean descent as well, I am deeply troubled by the tone and the nature of the events that have transpired over recent years, and in particular, the rise in hate crimes against Asians in this country. We know that the reported hate crimes are rising, but I honestly don't think we know exactly what caused those sharp rises. Now, according to the Pew survey conducted in early April, uh, asking Asian Americans what we thought were the cause of the spike the response generated a long list that cited, among others, Donald Trump, racism, COVID-19, scapegoating, ignorance, China's rise, 
misinformation, the news media, among many other reasons for the rise in violence against Asian Americans. It could also be that they are now finally being reported on by the mainstream media and investigated. Now, we should bear in mind that the issue of invisibility or not being heard has long afflicted the Asian American community. Anyone who has been concerned about hate crimes against Asians in America know that this has been happening long before the recent sharp rise, as the prior panel had clearly already indicated. Although, as I noted, that I don't think we can honestly attribute a specific cause uh, for this sobering trend, I think we can confidently say that we do know that hate crimes stem from racism and ignorance. And that's what I think we need to focus on. And this brings me to my second point. The problem transcends one political party or leader. There is a tendency in our hyper-partisan media environment to always try to place the blame for an issue on the other political party. When the media and when we ourselves parry those narratives and demonize the other because of their political party affiliation or ascribing malice and hate as their motivation, we don't help solve the problem. In fact, we're contributing to the problem by creating even more polarization in our politics, in our society. It is hard to know what determines how one thinks, but we can certainly judge one's actions. And hate crimes and racism really strikes at the heart of the idea of America. And it affects all of us, even if we are not personally targeted by the attacks. And it affects our foreign policy. And this brings me to my third and final point that is perhaps the most relevant to our focus of this panel. We must be mindful that foreign policy can have serious domestic implications. The inverse is also true. Domestic policy can also have serious foreign implications. There is a real and serious issue with the threats and challenges posed by the People's Republic of China. It's military, economic, and political. And there is more than ever before a, a bipartisan agreement that China is the pacing threat for the United States. This is true in both Republican and Democratic administration. I think to avoid confronting this reality and dealing with China with what we hope China could be cannot be part of this solution. But the solution to resolve a foreign policy challenge should not create more problems, especially at home. But with the proper focus, and I want to emphasize proper focus, I do think we can overcome these challenges. The first step is how we talk about the problem. And it goes back to what I was talking, saying earlier about the media and our own discourse. Alternatively, we, how we as a society treat African-Americans, Latino Americans, and all other Americans can and do have foreign implications as well. We need to be cognizant of that. We do have control over how we talk about the problem. We should also be aware that there will be foreign governments attempting to exploit tragic incidents for their own national interest. In essence, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to put as much emphasis as we do in communicating our policy priorities abroad, as we do in explaining with equal vigor the issues at home and that Asian American inclusion and belonging must be at the heart of those efforts. And I'll just conclude with one single point. Racism and by extension hate crimes feed off ignorance and education is a necessary but insufficient part of the solution. I'll just end there. Thank you. Well, Russell, uh, thank you so much for your um, very um, clear, coherent, and also comprehensive, you know, uh, points. And um, uh, you know, uh, refer to your first one. Talk about the progress and also problem. It's really a, a paradox, a paradox of hope and fear. Today is a very, very important day that the two Congress representatives could not attend in person because they're in White House to celebrate the, the signing of the, the COVID-19 um, Hate Crime Act. That's a landmark uh, you know, document. I actually wanted to ask uh, Diana whether Canada also will have this kind of uh, legislation bill or in other country. I hope that uh, this is a good example. But at the same time, that we do not see uh, the hate crime job. And uh, there's some concern and about the future. And um, so again, and uh, Russell, for your very candid and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, points and uh, really um, your perspective, I said early on, it's very, very important for this discussion. Um, Jessica. 
for us to yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and thank you to my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, uh, this is just like a dream come true to be able to talk about this uh, issue with such um, uh, colleagues who are so uh, well informed on uh, so many issues, but also happen to be Asian American like me and understand how deeply personal uh, this issue is for all of us. And uh, that it does take a, a little bit of courage to come out and talk about these issues uh, in ways that directly connect to uh, our work on foreign policy. So I want to commend my colleagues for uh, their remarks uh, and Dr. Lee for your leadership in organizing this uh, with your colleagues at Brookings. Um, you know, like Russell, I'll try to uh, make some brief uh, remarks because I know you have questions for us, but I wanted to start off with uh, some um, personal reflections. You know, when I started writing about this issue last March, um, I remember feeling a bit frustrated because I had served, as you said, as for four years as a community organizer with the Korean American community. And there was a lot of resistance among Korean Americans I worked with to speak out on, on, on issues related to foreign policy. This was during the fire and fury period, mind you, um, back in 2017, when you know media really wanted to hear from Korean Americans about how they were you know, viewing a potential preemptive strike by the United States on North Korea. And there was a lot of resistance. And I think, you know, to Diana's point, you know, the fact that we're able to have these kinds of cross-cutting discussions that, you know, bring in both the domestic perspective as the earlier panel did and foreign policy, I think is, is a sign of progress. Um, I remember when I was a staff member uh, you know, at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, it took me a very long time to get TSSCI clearance. Uh, and I remember getting picked on and experiencing microaggression uh, from uh, my coworkers. Uh, like Diana, I was born abroad, I was born in South Korea, and it just took a long time for the investigators to, to, to you know, get through the clearance uh, uh, process, as some of you who have done it uh, will know. It took me a year and a half, and during that time, it was uh, painful, uh, you know, to hear the the comments, you know, my colleagues would make, uh, uh, you know, jokingly, uh, but in ways that clearly, uh, you know, um, was meant to, uh, you know, to say maybe I don't belong there, uh, maybe something's wrong. Uh, um, and so I, I, I bring that up because, I, I, again, I think uh, this issue really uh, is something that, you know, um, we need to not just be wearing our uh, Asian American hat or foreign policy hat, but it, it really uh, behooves us to look at it in a multi-dimensional way uh, because it does have direct impact on people's livelihoods and, and jobs. In the early days of the pandemic, uh, President Trump, uh, you know, had uh, crossed out the term, uh, you know, Corona and put China in a flashcard before a speech. Uh, and this uh, photo of that uh, uh, card, uh, you know, went viral. And I remember looking at the photo and feeling really strange and afraid. I didn't know what was happening uh, and what this meant for me and my family. Um, and, you know, I, I so I, I remember, you know, kind of uh, at that moment, uh, really wanting to uh, shine light on how such racialized language, uh, you know, might be connected to this over the top, um, hyper militarized US policy toward China. But if I'm being totally honest with you, I didn't want to be out there writing about this initially, uh, because I knew there would be backlash and I knew there would be folks who question uh, there would already be questions about, you know, anyone who challenges the, the dominant view and narrative about U.S. policy toward China. I also didn't want to draw myself uh, attention to myself as an Asian American saying these things. But the more I dug into the research, um, you know, and, and kind of the history of, of Asian American racism and also uh, other minority uh, communities that have undergone uh, systemic racism and discrimination at the height of foreign policy, uh, you know, decisions and wars and so forth, the more I saw the connections between foreign policy and domestic policy, as uh, Russell just noted, you know, whether it's in the form of promoting a more militarized foreign policy or um, other uh, types of connections. And in fact, the first, first article that I wrote last May, you know, I, I, I cited a study that was conducted by the Government Accountability Office uh, that looked at various uh, branches of U.S. executive branch, uh, you know, in, in the lead up to 2001 and saw that uh, these agencies lacked diplomats and intelligence specialists in hard, learn, hard to learn languages from the Middle East, which, quote, weakened the fight against international terrorism, unquote, and likely led to blind spots in the lead up to the Iraq invasion. A few minutes ago, Dr. Lee, as you noted, President Biden signed uh, the COVID Hate Crimes Act, and he touted it as a very important tool for the Justice Department to strengthen its partnership with the Asian American community to prevent you know, hate crimes going forward. And he noted, you know, to his credit, language and cultural barriers that victims are often faced with uh, when trying to report uh, these incidents. President Biden also, you know, rightly implored that we have to change the hearts of the American people and that hate can be, you know, quote, given no safe harbor, 
uh, in the United States. And I think these words are powerful and these steps like the legislation is useful, but I think a lot more can be done. So I'll go ahead and make my three points. I think first, uh, we have to recognize that a hostile relationship with China would make the United States less safe, not more. It would lead to expensive arms racing, economic and cultural decoupling, as well as a, a less cooperation to combat urgent transnational issues like climate change and pandemics. Constantly bashing China for every problem that we're faced with here in America will only make conflict more likely, even if the United States government claims that it has no interest in seeking confrontation with Beijing. On top of that, this harsh rhetoric has a direct impact on peace and stability of our society. By othering Chinese Americans, and by extension, all Asian Americans like me, this fear mongering subjects Asian Americans to hostility for the and anger. Um, it also, you know, points uh, it puts blame on us indirectly for the the half a million lives lost uh, through the pandemic. So it's very dangerous. Uh, people are already angry in this country as it is. They're angry that they can't send their kids to school or hold a job uh, or have to risk uh, their job uh, and their health uh, when they go out. Scapegoating an entire community is like throwing uh, gasoline into a fire, uh, into the fire in a situation like this. So it's incredibly uh, damaging and dangerous. Finally, I think we need a, a policy strategies on China that won't lead to fear, anxiety, or hatred toward Asian Americans. And I think this will require work. I think it will require not just laws and executive orders that uh, are part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Uh, they won't, as pre uh, President Biden said, necessarily change the hearts of Americans. So we're going to have to look for creative solutions similar to what the first panel discussed in terms of cross-racial uh, um, you know, uh, community organizing, response, uh, and, and really elevating this issue at the highest level um, and, and not just looking at it primarily through law enforcement or data collection uh, angle, which uh, is what the U.S. government has done to date. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, not only well said, but also I particularly in, um, enlightened by your courage to say these could be very provocative uh, for many and especially touch the centerpiece of the current policy towards China in Washington. Um, so again, thank you, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Jessica, and Russell, and Diana for sharing your insights and perspectives. Now, I would like to uh, first ask a question for all of you, then one specific question for each of you before opening to uh, the audience question. Now, here's a general question. As some of you discussed in uh, your opening remark, particularly also in the first panel just mentioned, uh, the US Congress has uh, recently initiated and uh, is likely going to pass a few bills designated um, uh, to counter China's influence, such as the Endless Frontier Act, which actually passed uh, in Senator, I believe that uh, today or yesterday, right? And uh, also, the, the Strategic Competition Act, uh, which you, uh, uh, will be still on the, on, on the floor, the Senator floor. Now, a few lawmakers express their reservations with these bills. Representative, uh, Representative uh, Ihan Omar from Minnesota, for example, said a couple of days ago, I quote here, she said, I quote, we need to distinguish between justify um, criticism of the Chinese government's human rights record and the Cold War mentality that uses China as a scapegoat for our own domestic problems and demonizes Chinese Americans, end quote. Now, some analysts and um, activist groups, uh, I believe that the Quincy also probably uh, participated that, uh, uh, as a group to, uh, to raise some concern uh, Quincy Institute, worry that uh, these bills will lead to three outcomes. Number one, risking uh, destructive consequences with, China, with Beijing. Number two, inflaming racism against the Asian Americans at home. And number three, undermining American alliances, relationships, and people-to-people -people ties with Asian countries. Do you share this 
worries. So who will like to first? Or oh, is there any way we can stop these kind of things? Let these things not happening. You know, again. Um, yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on this grenade. Um, but you know, I, I, so I do think it's very important to uh, to put this in perspective uh, because, in my view, I think these legislative efforts were developed in response to Beijing's aggressive action. So, you know, sort of the notion that somehow that these legislative efforts would lead us into a more destructive relationship with China, suggesting that maybe that you know. Uh, the U.S. Congress is sort of to blame is, I think, you know, has it, you know, the, uh, it's not that way. It should be, the, you know, it's the other way around. Um, in my view, I think they really represent a, a long overdue course correction uh, from the previous approach of engagement in the hopes of changing Beijing's behavior that really arguably led us to this point where that necessity, such a change in our approach to, um, you know, in, in China policy. I think we're clearly now in a state of uh, strategic competition with China, the People's Republic of China. But I don't think that that competition needs necessarily to lead to conflict and to expect that somehow this will inevitably lead to conflict is I think a, a, a huge assumption. Um, I think given the state of the situation, um, we should be we should get used to a more persistent level of friction, open-ended friction perhaps with, with Beijing. Uh, and, and I personally think that Beijing knows this as much as well. And perhaps they are a bit better equipped to deal with this, given how they're able to effectively censor information that reaches their population. Um, you know, as for, um, you know, inflaming racism against Asian Americans, I, I certainly hope not. Um, but I, I do think that there are things that we can do. And I, I, know, I noted that in our in my opening comments, um, I think that we need to put as much emphasis in how we communicate our policy priorities to our allies and partners, as we also communicate to our domestic population about the nature of the challenge. And I, and I completely subscribe to uh, Jessica's earlier point that we need to minimize the fear and anxiety uh, towards uh, Asian Americans as we pursue uh, this, uh, this, this policy approach. Um, and I think the third part of this was undermining American alliances uh, or a relationship with Asian countries. I, I actually don't think that it would. I think that allies and partners would be large, are largely in support of a more competitive approach uh, to the PR, uh, to People's Republic of China. Um, and that there would be no way in which um, these countries, uh, allies and partners in particular, would, could take on Beijing, would confront Beijing without, without US leadership. So, um, I, uh, so yeah, that's, that, those are my, my, my uh, yeah. Thank you for providing uh, your perspective. Yeah. Uh, Jessica or Diana? Yeah, Diana first. Yeah, if I might just jump in really quickly. I know Jessica, you've written quite a bit about this and I look forward to hearing your comments about that. But I wanted to respond very quickly to Russell. I, I hear what you're saying, Russell, in, in terms of the fact that, um, you know, it's not really fair to say that DC policymakers are the one to cast the first stone in terms of setting this kind of aggressive confrontational tone because, you know, Beijing's been on wolf warrior diplomacy for quite some time now. And so I hear, I think that's a very fair point um, that I share. However, I think the point is not who is the provocateur here, but rather what is the consequence of this, especially for uh, Asian Americans. Um, and here I, I do think that um, this kind of rhetoric that is escalating into this kind of Cold War, neo-Cold War rhetoric, it will, and I'm, maybe I'm being a pessimist, but I think it will in fact inflame racism against Asian Americans for the very simple fact that when policymakers say something, whether it be you know, the Asian virus or Chinese influence or the China threat or whatever it might be, that is retweeted, it is parroted, it is echoed very, very quickly through social media to society. And so when, when they, they, they sort of policymakers sort of in, in a way kind of set the tone, set the terminologies with which we come to engage in a public discourse about some of these issues. And so I, I was just looking up, you know, um, reading up a, a little bit about it and I wanted to, um, you know, sort of quote uh, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Schumer, Chuck Schumer's um, uh, comment about the bill. He says, we can either have a world where the Chinese Communist Party determines the rules of the road for 5G artificial intelligence and quantum computing, or we can make sure the United States gets there first. This kind of rhetoric, this kind of zero sum game, either China wins or the US wins, either it's, it's, you know, you're with us or against us. I think this kind of discourse does not help 
um, the situation with um, with Asian, uh, you know, anti Asian racism. And I think that there's going to be also a um, a sort of knock on effect in terms of policymaking in other places that America considers to be to, uh, its allies, right? Already we're seeing the rise of hawkish attitudes towards China in Canada with um, led by the conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole. Um, so you might be seeing that there's a ripple effect in terms of these kinds of bills um, that they have on other countries starting to, to pass those bills. And also, I think it does invite further backlash from Beijing. We've already seen that Beijing has voiced very, very strong opposition to the bills. I was just looking up some um, op-eds that were, you know, in, in, you know, the sort of official party news. And they're saying that in America, the political will to crush China's rise is bipartisan, right? So you're seeing this, like, uptake and in, in, in escalation of, of this rhetoric. And I'll, I'll lastly, I'll say, I'll say from the perspective of American allies um, in Canada, it's also not going to help with the situation in Canada, because um, as, as some of you might know, the biggest problem that the Canadian government faces and has faced for a long time has been the detainment of the two Michaels, um, you know, as a result of the 5G, uh, or sort of as a result of the uh, Meng Wanzhou affair. And so, Bills like these, um, you know, that sort of confront China sort of in a very direct way kind of lessens the space for negotiation for some of these other kind of uh, diplomatic efforts that are very pressing for even America's allies. Well, um, both Russell and Diana um, really make a good point uh, that uh, downward spiral, of course, there's multiple reasons that uh, um, Russell, you're absolutely right that we can have a long list about the Chinese conduct, conduct with a, a you know a, a kind of aggressive approach to you know um, uh, Taiwan uh, and um, and uh, and also domestic uh, uh, you know kind of lack of a, a tightened political control and um, the, the economic front the, uh, we 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 are critical about the, some of the uh, mercantilist policies and etc. And uh, also target uh, some of the countries, uh, and uh, you know, uh, so there's a long list. But the point is, as Steiner said uh, later on, the result is leading that direction. But maybe we um, both sides, this kind of mutually reinforced fear, um, you know, accelerated the process and the action reaction downward spiral. Jessica, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I know we're running out of time, but you know, I, I think uh, Russell and Diana make really good points. I think this is the kind of nuanced conversation we need, frankly, uh, rather than accusing each other of, you know, overlooking the issue or uh, under-examining certain dimensions. I mean, of course, you know, I think as Russell alluded to, the fault is not entirely or solely on U.S. government, as Diana said, um, you know, articulately. There are also uh, uh, folks in the conspiracy theory side who are latching on to uh, these on baseless accusations or you know thoughts about Asian Americans and uh, there are other you know fact and of course China and, and its behavior um, you know I think there are a lot of dimensions to this challenge uh, for sure uh, but the point I want to make is you know as I've written about uh, and 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 looked into this you know I, I've seen you know the, the fact that politicians uh, American politicians, you know, starting at the top uh, during the Trump administration, but particularly in Congress, you know, this issue of demonizing China has become sort of a, a, a cost free exercise that people are doing much more just regularly. It's just now commonplace. Um, you know, Congressman and Rob Whitman, uh, for example, had tweeted that China's goal is nothing less than the complete destruction of the United States. He said this in response to the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus's call to cut some portions of the defense budget in order to channel more money toward global health. Now, tell me that is not outlandish, over the top language, right? And what will, uh, uh, you know, how could that be interpreted by an average American? How could that be exploited? I mean, that really, I think, uh, gets to sort of the heart of the issue. Now, keep in mind that some of the members of Congress who are most vocal about this full, you know, uh, spectrum, uh, you know, competition with China uh, for decades to come. Um, some of them are uh, among the most, um, uh, the highest recipient of arms control and uh, defense manufacturing companies. So there is money to be made when there's war and threat of war looming at every corner. I and mean, we have to be honest about how power and influence in Washington works, right? And so these are the, uh, the other dynamics that I think we need to be clear eyed about. Who benefits from maximum threat and you know, exaggerated uh, concerns about China taking over the United States tomorrow? And who loses? You know, what do American taxpayers think? Do they even have a seat at the table in these 
discussions. I mean, those are the types of things we should also take into account rather than just have an abstract foreign policy conversation. Well, China did this, well, US is doing that. Well, that's great, but let's also think about how how this is being politicized, racialized, and then put in a domestic frame uh, that in, in a place you know like Washington, where there are very few Asian lawmakers, very few I I Asian policymakers at the table, we're literally invisible in most of these conversations. So I think that creates the perfect storm that we're seeing now, where our community is just really just collateral damage. And and I think this is uh, something that we need to look at very closely, rather than say you know. Um, uh, you know, let's let's just kind of uh, think about it as a civil rights issue and, and pass some laws that, you know, collect data more adequately. I mean, I think that the problem is much bigger and systemic uh, than, you know, folks, uh, I think, in the civil liberties community think. Well, Jessica, you, re you certainly raise it, uh, that important issue, which is uh, has not been, you know, in our uh, uh, debate at the moment that uh, really put aside. We constantly talk about uh, these rhetorics about the uh, about the China threat, but now the uh, not look at some other other issues and the costs and benefits and how to rationalize U.S. foreign policy. Now, let me uh, um, uh, ask you, uh, um, you know, uh, first, Jessica. Now, in your co, co also the article uh, earlier this week on the chilling effects of the anti-China bills, that uh, you made a strong critique about the media bias in the U.S. mainstream media coverage of China under the pressure of the containing the so-called uh, malign inference of the Chinese Communist Party. You wrote, I quote, the approach in these bills risks threatening the integrity of free media or free press. This critique has been shared by some, maybe even many of the people in the Chinese uh, American community. Um, they were not so much covered in the mainstream media. So would you please elaborate on your critique? Sure, I think we have like about 10, yeah, 10 minutes left. So I'll try to be brief so my colleagues can speak up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Lee. Um, you know, as you noted in the beginning, the Strategic Competition Act that's now moving its way, uh, as well as the Endless Frontier Act, um, is part of this now omnibus China mega bill uh, that uh, Leader Schumer is actively trying to pass uh, into law as, as quickly as possible. Um, and I noted, you know, as part of a series of articles that my colleagues and I wrote uh, on responsible statecraft, that there are a, a certain number of very problematic provisions in the SCA, uh, but we don't have time to go over all of them. So I'll just stick to one. You know, you mentioned the, the term malign influence of CCP, and this uh, appears repeatedly uh, in the SCA bill. Uh, this is a very broad term. It is very broad. It will deliberately stoke fear and suspicion uh, and blame uh, on on not just Asian Americans who might have any connections or affiliation with uh, China, but to non-Asian Americans as well. Um, it's a generalized and fear-based language that normalizes discourse uh, about China that is alarmist and McCarthyist in nature. And I think it, it risks tainting people of Chinese descent or anyone with you know, connections, like I said, to Chinese universities or businesses, et cetera, uh, to be uh, subject to baseless accusations of being associated as agents uh, of the Chinese government. Uh, as the legal scholar Margaret Lewis writes, uh, this leads to criminalization of China-ness. Uh, I'm not even Chinese American, but I am very worried about this kind of language. I'm married to a Chinese American. I'm Asian American. Nobody cares if once they walk out, you know, my house, if I'm Korean or not. I mean, you know, these are the types of broad kind of suspicion raising language that, you know, is being, uh, you know, quickly ex uh, exp expeditiously passed in, in the Congress without proper uh, and uh, adequate public debate. And so, you know, I think that is one of many examples in which uh, there is this uh, rush to uh, lock the United States and China into permanent state of enmity uh, with the Asian American community sort of, you know, uh, as collateral damage. And I think this is very dangerous and it needs to be pushed back. So I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank well, you. thank you. Yeah, uh, let me move to, uh, again, we certainly uh, can talk a lot about the, the role of media and uh, also how to maintain the integrity at this difficult time. Right, dangerous time. Now, a uh, question for Russell. You know, as we know, that the China is currently one of the very few topics on which Democrats and the Republicans in the U.S. Congress could reach bipartisan agreement. So, in your presentation, you also discuss the problem with anti-Asian hate crimes transcending one particular party and the leader. These are excellent points. Uh, certainly, it's not just by one party or one leader. You know, it's not fair to blame uh, everything to one leader. Now, uh, but it's also interesting to see that um, 
uh, in the the in the, the bill that just passed, despite the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act passing the House, I mean, Tuesday, by an overwhelming 364 to 62 vote. But all 62 votes against the bill were cast by Republican members of the Congress. Now you also see the early presentation, there's some differences, but also surveys after surveys show uh, usually uh, Republican, uh, just a general public, uh, Republican members, you just think China's threat is like a 10 to 20% points more than Democrats. So do you see any kind of partisan difference in that framework? Again, I acknowledge your overall uh, you know, assessment is, um, is very much on the mark, but uh, could you uh, uh, comment on that? Yeah, thanks for um, that easy question. Ten. Oh. Um, you know, I won't pretend to know what the motivations or the calculations uh, are for the members who voted against the Hate Crimes um, Act. I, I think um, politics is a messy and complicated process, um, but I'll admit that the optics are not good. Um, for Republicans in general on this issue, and and I but I, and I think that there are many Republicans out there yeah. who would also agree with me on that. And I think that's really all, all I'd say about that. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, Diana, uh, your research focuses on civil society, popular protest, state uh, repression, and authoritarian citizenship in the PRC. Now, I have a question about the, how the Cold War style confrontation, the term we may, we may use with China, and also anti-Asian racism is perceived uh, by and affects Chinese intellectuals and the general public in China. Do you agree with the view that these recent developments here in the United States often play in favor of the Chinese authoritarian government, provide the ammunition, for anti-American sentiment, ultra-nationalism, and further marginalized liberal intellectuals in Chinese society. Because this is relevant to very, very important things. You know, the US leverage should also reach the, the Chinese you know, people that we're supposed to you know, uh, 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 help, right? But uh, in, uh, in the result, it's just the opposite as my observation. Your views, your take on this? Right. This is a really important question, Chung. And here I want to offer a bit of a corollary, perhaps, to what Jessica stated earlier, which is that I think there is an interesting parallel in the way that policymakers in D.C. tap into populist sentiments such as the China threat to advance their own interests. Just as American politicians are doing that, Chinese politicians are doing the same thing with um, every time that racism comes up or any sort of social ills or social problems come up in the US, Beijing is very clever to jump on it right away to point to the flaws in American society and especially to the, what they see or what the propaganda says is that the inherent flaws of democracy as America is, is exhibited in the, in the storming of the Capitol and in the hashtag BLM movement. And so um, in terms of the anti-Asian race hate uh, uh, surge and, and in terms of the social movement that is going on, I think Beijing has again been very clever to tap into that kind of discourse in order to say, in order to really demonize American society and democracy as well. And to say that, um, you know, racism is just an inherent and unfixable part of American democracy. There is a an op-ed in the uh, Global Times newspaper in March of 2021, so just this, just a couple months ago, that says um, Asian American racism stems from deep racial hatred in the U.S. melting pot. And if you go to this op-ed, there shows a cartoon that depicts a white guy in a suit. You know, it could be any number of D.C. policymakers trying to douse using a small vase of water, trying to douse these ravaging flames that are labeled racism. Right, and the point of the op-ed is that. Racism is so endemic to the fabric of American society that basically, you know, that the Beijing model is superior to the American model. So what you're seeing from both sides is the utilization by uh, by politicians, really, of, of various parties, of various stripes, of various agendas to use and to tap into these kind of populist sentiments, and as well as the force of social movements to advance their own agendas. Okay, Diana, that's that's good. And uh, this is a related uh, audience question. I think it's a uh, it's a very good one. I think that uh, I I wanted to um, share with you two questions from audience. I'm sorry that we cannot share too many. Now, uh, 
what is the end game in the US-China strategy competition that the Washington policymakers have in mind, which can advance American security and the civil liberties? You know, that's a certain question caught to my attention that uh, I wish I knew the answer. Uh, this is one, I mean, you, I welcome your, your comments or your answer to this question. And um, now the second one is um, from um, Walker Ahmad, is editor of Asia Think Tank. Uh, the question is, can Asians uh, shape US foreign policy? Now, as a, discuss, uh, as, a, as a discourse written by uh, Fari Zakoria and uh, the business tycoons of Asia has a great influence in US politics. Again, we talk about the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party, but there's a real uh, influence probably through money side. Maybe it's combined together. So of course, it's still a valid concern. So these are the two questions. We still have three minutes. So one for each. Who would like to pick which one? Well, I can try to tackle the first question, but okay. like you said, uh, it's a it's a difficult one. So I'm not sure I can do justice. But you know, I guess it it goes to you know the the question of you know is United States going to seek primacy and dominance in Asia, uh, and will that lead to conflict with China? Is it is that inevitable? You know, or is the United States willing to take a more humble, uh, restrained approach to foreign policy uh, in Asia? I think that's the central question. And depending on where you land, you're going to have very different answers to how to, uh, you know, how you would kind of define success uh, in terms of a U.S. Uh, foreign policy toward China that's more stabilizing, less, uh, you know, uh, confrontational, zero sum. Um, and so, you know, I uh, and two of my colleagues wrote a full report on on what that vision looks like uh, back in January. I encourage folks to check it out at Quincy Institute website. But yeah, it's it's a it's a really uh, difficult issue, particularly in this moment of of extreme domestic upheaval uh, and suffering. You know, I think the question of what is the United States willing to do and what are the you know areas that it's willing to compromise becomes much more salient than ever before. So yeah. I think that that conversation needs to be had. Yeah, it's partially probably related with Diana said earlier. It's more to do with domestic politics in both sides. Uh, in this case, certainly it's a U.S. domestic politics, you know, and uh, uh, politicians that both parties want to have votes. So usually play tougher on China uh, will win the votes. So that's kind of explain that. But uh, it's really served American interest. That's a different matter. This is, but I think this is the essence of that question. Uh, anyone for the other, uh, or this question or, or the um, other one? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll quickly just jump in the first question. I think the key principle should be should be reciprocity, right? And I think that should be the basis upon which the U.S.-China relationship should, you know, uh, move forward. And that's, I think, all that we should expect and can expect. And, you know, basing it on stability, we're basing it on, you know, uh, on mutual beneficial, you know, interests. Um, I think those are those are those are too big of terms that are not not useful in the context current context of the strategic competition. Um, secondly, I mean, if I were to just answer that, I know we, we have limited time, but uh, answer the question differently. But it's to say that I think Asian Americans can and should have a great deal of positive influence on U.S. foreign policy towards Asia. I mean, period, right there. Good, good, Diana. Okay, um, very quickly. So I don't know that either side has an end game in mind. I think right now what you're seeing is a politics of reaction. It's a politics of escalation. And that cycle needs to be broken. And the responsibility for breaking that cycle rests not only in the policymakers' hands at the elite level, but also on uh, the responsibility of civic institutions, such as Brookings, such as uh, universities, such as religious institutions, such as social movement institutions, that there needs to be what uh, Chung has beautifully written about in his book, a lot more people to people exchange, because it's a lot of times it's at the subnational level, it's at the community level, that dialogues about very real issues such as racism ought to be had. And unfortunately, we're not in a political environment where that's encouraged. But as soon as the political opportunity opens, I think that's really where that reciprocity that you were talking about, Russell, ought to happen, not just at the elite level, but really at the at the at the ground level, because at the moment, neither government can claim moral superiority in addressing any of these deeply embedded issues such as racism. China has its own racism issues. The United States has its own racism issues. Both need to recognize uh, you know, the limits and constraints of what their governments can do. And there's a lot of mutual learning that needs to go on. And that infrastructure of mutual learning is what we need to build. Well, um, uh, reciprocal 
and uh, empathy, and also that uh, um, people to crypto communication, you know, these are the good words that we hear. Now, unfortunately, the time has come to bring this important discussion to a close. I would like to offer my deepest appreciation to our distinguished panelists, and especially early on the representative um, Kim and the Meng for joining us on this uh, momentous week for AAPIs, and also for the older panelists uh, that um, is this one and the, also previous one, you did a fantastic job. Now this event has helped illuminate both the challenges facing the AAPI community and our efforts to recognize and overcome these challenges in both domestic and foreign policy domains. Now, I also want to thank Brookings colleagues, President John Allen, my dear friend, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, members of the Inclusion and the Diversity Committee, including Greg Song, Suzanne uh, Schelfer, and Andrew Chong for your leadership and the input, not only for on this event, but also other activities and the dialogues celebrating uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. With that, I wish all viewers a happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Thank you very much. We conclude here. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.